Um, so thank you to every, everybody for being here. Thank you to the organizers for having me and all of the volunteers that made this happen. It's a lot of effort and uh, um, and I think you do great work. So um, I'm going to be talking about a project that I spent a lot of the last year working on fairly intensively. Um, there's a, a formal academic paper that's available for free online if you Google this title. Here's the title of the paper. Here are my co-authors. And before I start, I maybe just want everybody to take a moment, 10, 15 seconds, and I want you to think a little bit about what financial health means to you, what financial stress might mean to you, who's healthy, who's stressed. So let's just take a moment and kind of think about that a little bit, and then I'll tell you about what we learned about these phenomena in Canada. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with a brief overview of the project. So what did we do? We took uh, survey data. The survey is one that's been run since 2009. They run it once a year. It's the Canadian Payroll Association that, uh, that conducts the survey. They've been doing it annually since 2009. And we have 11 years worth of data. Uh, and over that 11 year period, over 35,000 different people responded to the survey. So we have a lot of data. And if you look at the sort of the demographic uh, characteristics of the responding population through time, they're very consistent. They closely resemble the Canadian po population. So we have really, really a lot of very high quality data to work with. We applied something called cluster analysis, which is uh, a technique in, in what we call unsupervised machine learning. In this context, what cluster analysis does is it allows us to identify patterns, common patterns, in the way people filled out the survey, no matter how complex those patterns are, no matter how invisible they might be to the naked eye. Okay, so that's what we did. Um, and among other things, one of the things that the algorithm told us very clearly that, the, that every respondent can be put into one of three categories. And I might add, this is a survey of employed Canadians. So every employed Canadian that filled out the survey can be put into one of three mutually exclusive groups. The first group we called financially stressed. So this group uh, has difficulty saving, isn't able to save a large fraction of their, of their income. Uh, they would have a hard time dealing with brief financial setbacks. So these are things like your paycheck is delayed for a week. How hard would that be for you to navigate? Um, how hard would it be for you to, excuse me, to come up with $2,000 on short notice in an emergency? So those are some of the features that characterize this financially stressed group. At the opposite end of the, of, the, uh, of the wellness spectrum, if you will, the financial wellness spectrum, is the comfortable group. They are able to save a good chunk of their income. They would be able to manage those brief financial setbacks and they have other characteristics as well. And in the middle is what we call the coping group. So they have some of the characteristics of the stress group. Maybe they have a hard time saving. A particular individual in that group might have a hard time saving, but might actually be okay when it comes to the setbacks, right? So people in the coping group tend to have, and every individual in that group is different, they tend to have some, but not all, the characteristics of either the stress or the comfortable group. And what we found was that it was really um, your savings habits and your ability to deal with these setbacks that determined which group you got put into. Okay, those were the key determinants of, of, where the, of how you were categorized by the algorithm. Uh, and I'll just mention before I move on to sort of the key insights or the key takeaways, the general interest that comes out of this, the distinguishing features of what we did were the data that we had, the consistency of it, the longevity of it, really high quality data, and the methodology. To the best of our knowledge, cluster analysis, you know, machine learning in general has never really been applied in this context to kind of understand um, financial health, not just in Canada, but anywhere else. Okay, so that's sort of a very brief overview of the project, and what I'm gonna do now is just briefly describe three of the key general interest insights that came out of this work. So number one, financial stress is surprisingly well widespread. 
Um, and so one third over that 11 year period, those more than 35,000 distinct people, different people that responded to the survey, all about exactly one third of them were categorized as financially stressed. One third coping, one third um, comfortable. We didn't impose that by any stretch. This was, this is uh, very much data driven. So something I forgot to mention on the previous slide is one of the nice things about cluster analysis relative to some other tools that have been used to study financial well-being is that it lets the data speak as loudly as possible. So we're not injecting or imposing any preconceived notions that we might have about what financial stress looks like. We're letting the data speak as loudly as it can to tell us what it is. Okay, so one of the things it told us very clearly was that one third of the people who responded to this survey were financially stressed. So if this is you, you're not alone. There's no shame in this, right? There's, there's, there's resources and there's help available. You're certainly not alone. Um, one of the sort of alarming things of this number is I mentioned, this is a survey of employed Canadians. We're not looking at, and most of the people that responded were employed on a full-time basis. So we're not really talking about precariously employed Canadians. We're not talking about unemployed Canadians. We're talking about here, I think over 90% of the people who responded to the survey were employed on a full-time basis. And one third of that group was categorized as financially stressed. And that's alarming. And one of the reasons it's alarming to me is many, a very high fraction of the people who were categorized as financial stress also reported feeling overwhelmed by their debt, right? So sort of psychological implications are uh, associated with financial stress. Uh, many of them reported that, that stress over money, money worries was impacting their performance at work, right? So there are a lot of people who are affected in a very profound way by this. Um, and so clearly there, there, are, there, are this, there are policy implications here from a government's perspective. What can, what can the government do to maybe educate people, put tools in their hands to budget a little bit better, to save a little bit better? We're not experts in this area. I'm, I'm a faculty member in the math department. I'm good at sort of looking through data and kind of understanding what's going on with the data. Um, I'm certainly not a policy expert. But there's certainly probably a role the government can play in, in providing people with tools and educating them and empowering them um, to sort of move up the financial wellness spectrum from sort of the coping group to the comfortable group or the stress group to the coping group. And if you think about money flows to people through their employers, and so there's probably a role that employers can play. And I know the Canadian Payroll Association, who is a partner in the study and provided with this, us with the data, is very, very interested in this and thinking very hard about what they can do um, to help employers uh, alleviate the burden. Okay, so that's, the, that's one big key takeaway we found. Number two, and this was the one that was most surprising to us, financial stress is most emphatically not synonymous with low income. So I had this on my first slide. It said membership in the groups, degree of financial stress, if you will, is not determined by income. It has a lot more to do with almost behavioral things like savings habits and you know, ability to you know, have that buffer to deal with brief financial setbacks. Uh, stress is most emphatically not synonymous with low income. So earning a lot doesn't mean you're immune from financial stress. To put it into context, we looked at respondents who reported household incomes above $150,000. So the, the, the median Canadian household income as of the last census was about $70,000. So we're talking about people whose households earn more than double the sort of typical Canadian, and 20% of that group was categorized as financially stressed, right? Would have a hard time dealing with a one week delay in their pay or coming up with $2,000 in an emergency, things like that. So making a pile of money um, doesn't mean that you're immune from stress, right? Um, and so that makes things a little bit more complicated, right? It means financial stress is a little bit more complex and the solution isn't as simple as just giving people money or paying them more, right? We, it's, it's deeper than that. The other side of that coin is that low earners aren't doomed or consigned to financial stress. So we had a look at respondents whose household income was reported to be 
below 50,000, so this is significantly below the Canadian median, 20% of that group was financially comfortable, which is encouraging and suggests that maybe it's more behavioral than just sort of how much you make. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that um, shortly. So this is, this is key takeaway number two. Financial stress is absolutely not synonymous, or financial health is absolutely not determined by, synonymous with how much money you make. It can be good or bad. I think overall that's a good thing, and we'll get into that in a moment. Key takeaway number three is demographic. So what we did is we looked at whether or not a whole bunch of demographic variables or all the demographic variables that were collected in the survey. We didn't run the survey. Um, my role in this project was to analyze the data and to, to understand what was going on there. Um, but the survey did collect a whole bunch of different demographic variables and we looked very carefully to see whether or not any of these variables were related to financial stress. And the answer is they're not. So the way we worded it was stress is demographically agnostic. It doesn't care where you live. So the proportion of people that are stressed out in British Columbia, financially stressed in British Columbia, is roughly the same as the proportion in Quebec or the proportion in at Atlantic Canada. Atlantic Canada had a slightly higher proportion, but the effect was, was, uh, was pretty small. So financial stress doesn't care where you live, okay? Uh, we also looked at age. Younger people are, are, are at slightly more risk of being financially stressed, but again, the effect is very, very small. And so what's going on here is it's not like boomers have it all or baby boomers have it all figured out and millennials are clueless. It's exactly the opposite. They're both equally clueless or they both have it <laughs> as figured out, right? Like, I guess, I don't know where I fit in. I think I'm Generation X, which is kind of halfway between the two. Maybe, how old, what's the... 40 years maybe for a millennial, is that kind of the upper bound? Anyway, I digress. So the, the thing is here, financial stress doesn't care how old you are, right? Uh, there are a lot of people, a high percentage of people that responded to the survey that are nearing retirement, they're categorized as financially stre stressed. And that is a, uh, that is a concern. Okay, so uh, stress is demographically agnostic. It doesn't really care who you are, where you live, what you look like, if you're male or female, if you make a lot, you don't make a lot. It's demographically agnostic. So that makes it, like I said, that makes stress considerably more complex than I think a lot of us would have thought. Um, and that makes it a little bit more challenging when it comes to thinking about solutions. So that's where I'm gonna end off. Um, just sort of thinking about some of the next steps and what us as a team, um, industry academic, are thinking about going. So one of the things that we've learned and one of the things I hope I've impressed to you I'm going to finish soon, but one of the things I've hope, I hope that I've impressed you um, is that financial stress is more related to what you do, how you behave, how you make decisions, than it is who you are, how much you earn, where you live, what you look like, if you're male, if you're female. And that's a good thing, right? Because it means we can all um, sort of uh, escape and move in the right direction on that, uh, on that wellness spectrum. So what we'd like to do um, is we'd like to identify sort of behaviors or decision-making patterns that are related to stress. And so now what technically what we're, what we're looking into is, is supervised learning. So he's done supervised learning before he's put people into categories. And now with supervised learning, we're trying to identify what it was about you that got you put into this category, right? And if we can, just thinking about surveys for a moment, if we can say, oh, the answer to this question um, really had a big influence on which category you put, got put into. And if we can relate or tie that question to a specific behavior or a specific decision-making process, um, then maybe what we can do is kind of intervene and suggest how people can change these behaviors and improve their decision-making processes um, to move up the, uh, the wellness spectrum. Um, okay, and so these are things that we're just starting to think about right now. Um, I am going to, I'm going to conclude here, uh, but before I do that, I need to acknowledge this was very, very much a team effort. Um, funding was provided by the Canadian Payroll Association and the Fields Institute Center for Quantitative Analysis and Modeling. Um, generous funding, it allowed us to hire several graduate students, basically recent graduates on a full-time basis. 
and they did a lot of the heavy, heavy lifting here. And the data was provided by the Canadian Payroll Association via Framework Partners, which is the, uh, uh, the group that administered, the company that administered the, uh, the survey on behalf of, uh, of CPA. Okay, so thanks very much for your attention and I'm happy to, uh, to answer any questions you might have.